Good evening, everyone. Uh, Chairman Indian School of Urology, Professor Rajiv Sooth, Co-Chairman Indian School of Urology, Dr. Arun Chawla, and the faculty for today's uh, program, Dr. Heman Goel, uh, and uh, dear uh, residents. Today, we are having another important uh, topic in urology, female urology especially, that is urinary tract fistula. And uh, Dr. Heman Goel, who is the head of the Department of Urology and Renal Transplantation at RML Hospital, New Delhi, will be deliberating on this. He will be touching upon the various urinary tract fistulas, uh, the various modes of presentation, the evaluation protocol and management. And you will have uh, a good chance of interacting with uh, Dr. Hammond uh, in this program. And this is one of a very common uh, clinical condition in urology, in India especially. Uh, and uh, every day we, in the clinical practice, we come across uh, one of these cases. So it's a very important topic for all of you. And uh, with this, uh, I welcome you all once again to this uh, program of USI Resident Smart Learning uh, Program. With these few words, uh, I welcome the faculty also. Now I would request uh, Professor Rajiv Sooth, Chairman Indian School of Urology, to say a few words. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Rajiv TP. Uh, this is an uh, occasion today when we have chosen a topic which is very much relevant to the residents and uh, where it is uh, important that in the exam, in theory, and uh, I don't remember any examination, maybe as internal or as external, where VBI for vesicouretic fistula was not uh, there as a case, long case, short case. So be very, very, uh, to be very, very practical in our approach of choosing 50 odd lectures in this series, in the resident learning program, distant learning program, and uh, in this era of uh, COVID pandemic, I think we have all got acclimatized to this kind of uh, learning and uh, although uh, pandemic is not uh, welcome, but this period as has been planned and utilized along with me, um, our uh, dynamic secretary, Dr. Rajiv TP and uh, our uh, um, uh, available and uh, very, very enthusiastically involved uh, Dr. Uh, Arun Chavla who is uh, uh, coordinating all these 50 old lectures which are going to be archived and is a treasure for uh, US, uh, USI and Indian School of Urology. Now I'll uh, uh, thank Dr. Uh, um, uh, Hemant Goel, who is from uh, Dr. Ram Manor Lohia Hospital heading the department there. And uh, I, I, along with me, he has been working for so long there. And he is thoroughly conversant with the topic. He's an excellent faculty and uh, he will be giving you interactive talk and also I'll uh, request all the residents to ask as many as questions and uh, or the case presentations and also fill up the chat box with all your queries so that Dr. Arun Chavla can over the uh, course of the lecture and during discussion can take up those points uh, very effectively and these are the these are going to be the questions which are going to be asked in the exam and explanations are going to be provided by dr hemant goel so i hand over back to dr uh, rajiv tp to conduct for further uh, proceedings and uh, also to invite dr hemant goel for today's uh, distant learning lecture that is by Dr. Hemant Goel. Dr. Rajiv TP, please. Thank you, sir, for your enlightening words. Now I would request Dr. Hemant Goel, who is the head of the Department of Urology and Renal Transplant at RML Hospital, New Delhi, uh, to deliberate on this uh, today's topic, urinary tract fistula. Over to you, Hemant. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir, for giving this opportunity. And uh, I think I'll just go ahead with the lecture. So, uh, Dr. Hemant, a bit louder, please. Yeah, sir. Am I audible now, sir? Yeah. 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 So, sir, uh, so I'll go ahead with the lecture. Thanks. Thank you, sir, for giving me this opportunity. So, the topic of my uh, today's topic is urinary tract fistula. 
so uh, what we have designed is the lecture in a practical way so that basically for residents there are common problems how to uh, prevent the fistula how to evaluate the fistula and how to manage the fistula so genito urinary fistulas can be classified into two groups acquired and congenital so what we talk about is acquired fistula which can be obstetric gynecological it, it can be traumatic or accidental so these are the common fistulas which can be urethro vaginal fistula vasico vaginal fistula and vasico uterine fistula etiology differ in different parts of the world in developed world the most common etiology is from gynecological or urological pelvic surgeries whereas in developing world mostly from prolonged obstructed labor so the the etiology is entirely different in two different parts of the world developed world world it is more of gynecological surgeries and pelvic surgeries and developing world it is more of obstructed labor so these are the entire spectrum of etiology which can be traumatic traumatic post surgical following hysterectomy a very important new uh, subset of etiology is after anti incontinence surgery anterior anterior vaginal wall prolapse surgery vaginal biopsies which are now in vogue and they are increasingly being done and they therefore they are increased report of urethro vaginal fistula after these surgeries then the traditional causes like obstructed labor forceps laceration are all there which you must be well versed with so causes of vvf after pelvic surgery so what are the basic causes of vvf after pelvic surgery they are unrecognized cystotomy so there is a unrecognized bladder injury they can be tissue necrosis from cautery injury or they can be sutured through the bladder obstructed labor injury complex so this is uh, we should understand that this is not only obstructed vvf but it is a total obstructed labor injury complex the area which is colored usually involve the trigone bladder neck and the proximal urethra which is the first to undergo ischemic necrosis then there is the entire spectrum of this injury complex which can be urological injuries like vasico vaginal fistula urethro vaginal fistula urethro vaginal fistula utero vasical fistula they can be a complete urethral loss stress urinary incontinence secondary hydronephrosis renal failure so there is the entire spectrum which can be there with a the obstructed labor injury complex this depends on the degree of injury and the uh, cephalopelvic disproportion which is the basic cause of this obstructed labor injury complex they can be associated associated gynecological injuries uh, resulting in amenorrhea vaginal stenosis cervical damage or complete cervical disruption secondary pelvic inflammatory disease or secondary inflammatory then there can be a range of gastrointestinal gastrointestinal injuries with rectal injury musculoskeletal injuries neurologic injuries dermatological injuries and social injuries which is equally important like social isolation divorce worsening poverty and malnutrition suicide so when the patient is suggest when the patient symptoms are suggest of obstructive injury the important is we should not only look for a vvf there is the entire spectrum which we should we should look whether they are associated gynecological injuries gastrointestinal injuries and so on and so forth so uh what are the basic cause of this obstetric uh, injury complex so there is a low socioeconomic status of the woman with limited social roles and early marriage so there is a early child bearing at a early age which is resulting in cephalopelvic disproportion and there is lack of access to emergency emergency obstetric services which leads to obstetric labor and therefore this obstetric labor injury complex ultimately resulting in stigmatization isolation and loss of social support divorce worsening poverty so sorry so so uh, basically how do you classify fistula they can be simple fistula versus complicated fistula so what we need to know is a simple good prognosis fistula and rest all are all are complicated fistula so a single vasico vaginal fistula less than 4 cm where the adjacent vaginal tissue is healthy there is no scarring of vaginal tissue there is no involvement of urethra or ureter and there is uh, no previous attempt of surgery these all are simple good prognosis fistula rest all are complicated fistula whether there be multiple fistula involvement of urethra ureter large fistula more than 4 cm 5 cm or above or there is associated sui there are multiple previous attempt of repair these are all complicated fistula so we should always know that there is uh, there is a lot of di uh, difference between the prognosis so they are also known as 
गुड प्रोग्नोसिस सिंपल फेशुला और कॉम्प्लिकेटेड और फेशुला विद अनसर्टेन प्रोग्नोसिस सो हाउ डू वी प्रिवेंट दिस ऑब्सटेटिव फेशुला सो दे कैन बी प्राइमोडियल प्रिवेंशन लाइक गर्ल्स एजुकेशन इंक्रीज द एज ऑफ मैरिज एंड न्यूट्रिशियस डाइट प्राइमरी प्रिवेंशन इज अवेलेबिलिटी ऑफ फैमिली प्लानिंग मेथड सर्विसेज स्ट्रेटेजी टेक मदरहुड सेफर शुड बी फॉलोड आर रोल इज इन सेकेंडरी प्रिवेंशन where they, uh, the doctor they can the early recognition of the pelvic uh, pelvic disproportion and prevention of obstructed labor prolonged catheter drainage in prolonged or obstructed labor so wherever we suspect there can be a, a element of obstructed labor a prolonged catheter drainage is very important if fistula formation is suspected after obstructed labor so we insert an indwelling catheter and start continuous closed drainage ensure a high fluid intake early mobilization always keeping the back below her bladder after 7 to 10 days we examine the anterior vaginal wall in same position with a speculum if the bladder is still bruised or necrotic leave the catheter and remove only when healthy tissue is seen in next examination prevention of surgical fistula is equally important which can be prevented by adequate exposure during the surgery we have to minimize the bleeding and hematoma formation dissect in sur uh, correct surgical planes there should be wide mobilization of bladder and intraoperative retrograde filling of bladder is very important to identify any inadvertent cystotomies cysto urethroscopy not always available in ot especially gynae gyne ot but intraoperative retrograde filling is a very helpful technique where we can identify inadvertent cystotomy and there should always be availability of a sterile methylene blue in the ot uh, so we can identify and repair then and there now talking about the vesico vaginal fistula it is the most commonly acquired fistula of the urinary tract and the history dates back to 1663 when first surgical repair was done by hendrick then once the first surgical successful surgical repair was done by joan fascio in 1675 first transvaginal approach by james marion sims by in 1852 and first successful transabdominal approach in 1882 by tudelenburg so the patient of vesico vaginal fistula will come with a typical history of a past history of surgery followed by continuous leakage of urine so what are the physical examination we have to do it is a perspicular examination which is very important in our opd we have to identify the location size number the quality of vaginal mucosa cystoscopy along with vaginoscopy is adjoint to physical examination multiple fistula are located in the anterior vagina usually fistula are located in the anterior vaginal wall at the level of uh, cuff we have to look for signs of induration or inflammation because we have to identify whether it is a mature fistula or it is a immature fistula about the diagnosis we have to do a good physical examination we have to we can take the uh, help of clinical test like catheter test methylene blue test modified methylene blue test double dye test cystoscopy vaginoscopy and some radiological test like mcu iview ct urogram and mr urography so here i would like to say that uh, in examination we are often confused like what is the next best test available so for that i think the simplest way is you should know what are the indication of each test like there uh, a patient with a good with a history of continuous leakage of urine and on physical examination you can detect a fistula you know the diagnosis is vagi vesico vaginal fistula so what will be the next test if the if you, the next step will be a cystoscopy to identify that fistula you can directly see that fistula but in other case where you are the primary diagnosis is a urethro vaginal fistula so what will be the next investigation next investigation will be a ct urography or or ivp or rgp because now you have to see the upper tract so the next invest if you know which investigation So indication of each investigation we can plan the next best investigation so now the methylene blue test so what is a methylene blue test which is commonly done in the opd so it is to different the main aim of the test is to differentiate a small vvf from a urethro vaginal fistula so what we do in this a three piece of gauze what we do in this three piece of gauze are placed in the vagina 200 cc of sterile fluid with methylene blue is injected into the bladder the lower piece of gauze is discarded and it is usually stained during filling the bladder if the middle or upper piece stains the fistula is vesico vaginal and if there is no staining of methylene blue and it is wet then me that means it is a urethro vaginal fistula 
So the traditional way of doing was a three swab test with two different type of uh, agents. But this can easily differentiate a small BVS from a uretrovaginal fistula. This is a modified form of methylene blue test. A cystoscopy is very important. It has to differentiate an immature fistula from a mature fistula. Immature fistula is where there is an area of localized bullous edema without distinct ossea. We have to give more time for this fistula to mature so that a good repair can be done. Mature fistula is with smooth margin with variable size ossea. Okay. The biopsy is very essential in patient with history of malignancy. Upper tract imaging is important because concomitant ureteral injury is there in 10 to 15% cases of BBF. So for that, we can do IVU, we can do CT urography, even we can do RGP in acute cases. But usually when there is a delayed presentation, intravenous urography or CT urography is the investigation of choice. So this is a workup of a patient of VVF. The patient with suspected VVF due to urinary leakage. We have history plus physical examination and for small VVF, we can do diet test. So if we are after this, we are able to locate VVF. So we just confirm with pipe C, cystoscopy and bio, cystoscopy, sorry. We confirm with cystoscopy and we evaluate for concomitant upper tract by, by either CT urography or IVO. And if there is no upper tract injury, we directly go ahead with BVF repair. On the other side, after physical examination and history, if we are unable to locate VVF, so what we do is, so we have to see for VVF, we, we, here comes the role of VCUG or CT cystography because they can detect small VVF. Uh, so, so our MCU or a CT cystography is done if on history or physical examination, we are not able to detect a VVF. If a VVF is found, we evaluate for urotrovaginal fistula. If there is a concomitant urotrovaginal fistula, we repair both. If there is no urotrovaginal fistula, we just repair the VVF. So the treatment goals are to cessation of urinary leak, return of normal and complete genital function, lessen the physical and psychological impact. Controversies. So this is, I think the second most important part of the talk is what is what should be the for from resident point of view this is very important because uh, often they are asked what is the optimum time of repair use of estrogen and antibiotics then what is the optimum route of repair excision of tract whether we should excise the tract fistula tract or not and interposition graft whether we should use or not so i will try to answer these question so early versus repair uh, late repair so the basically the dictum is repair as soon as possible in hydrogenic or post-surgery VVF. So if there is a bladder injury and immediately we have identified post-surgery, they should be immediately repaired within 48 to 72 hours. But usually the presentation is delayed. Usually the urologist is called around one week, 10 days after the injury. So this is not the case, usual case, and we are not able to do immediate repair in most of the cases. So we favor early repair in properly selected patient. So what are the properly selected patients? Properly selected patient is where there is a good vaginal mucosa, the nutrition of the patient is good, there is a mature fistula. If it, it occurs in one to two months, we can operate that time also. But the classical opinion is to treat after three to six months delay. Early repair is not indicated in ischemic fistula, cuff infection and poor general condition. Post radiation fistula, we usually wait for six to 12 months. So shortening of the period is very important for totally wet patient, but one should not trade social inconvenience for compromised surgical success. So early versus late repair, again, I would like to say that we have to repair as soon as, it, as possible in hydrogenic or post-surgery VVF. Okay. Traditionally, classically, we wait for three months and then we repair VVF. But early repair should be done in a properly selected patient if in a properly selected patient we can even try a repair a two to three months but for classical it is three months now with a with vvf and urotrovaginal fistula urotrovaginal fistula there is no such three to six months waiting period urotrovaginal fistula can be repaired early because uh, it can be repaired early but the vvf usually we wait for three months now, what are the uh, preoperative consideration? Tissue should be free of infection, inflammation, and cancer. So, uh, physical examination is very important to rule out any presence of infection, inflammation, and cancer. If there is a history of radiation or cancer, we have to do biopsy. 
broad spectrum antibiotic especially when early repair is contemplated estrogen replacement in post menopausal and post hysterectomy fistulas are strongly recommended and now the route of repair so this is again a very controversial topic but it depends upon access to the fistula site mobility of the vagina and the surgeon expertise so i will put surgeon expertise on the top of this now in our center more than 90 almost 90 to 99 percent of the fistula are repaired vaginally and it can easily be done so abdominal repair is only done when the vaginal repair is not possible and it is rare so most of the cases can be repaired vaginally but still for exam point of view we have to say like for 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 beginners a low fistula urethra or just a urethral can be easily repaired vaginally when there is a combined a circumferential loss of bladder neck like obstructive uh, injury complex a combined abdominal vagina abdominal vaginal approach is required mid vaginal or high vaginal fistula mid vaginal fistula can easily repair transvaginally but a high vaginal fistula then it can be abdominal or vaginal approach approach but the most important part is the surgeon expertise from vaginal route you can repair almost all fistulas except a large post obstructed fistula complex where there is entire trigone bladder neck or proximal urethra is gone there we there we usually require a combined abdominal vaginal uh, repair second indication in our setup of abdominal repair is where there is a failed vaginal repair so two indication to me for abdominal repair is a failed vaginal repair and second is a circumferential loss of bladder neck where a combined abdominal vaginal repair is required rest all fistulas can be repaired vaginally most of the fistulas except in vvf not in urethral vaginal fistula so a transvaginal uh, approach you all know the advantages are avoidance of laparotomy and its morbidity shorter operative time early recovery short stay minimal post operative pain minimum blood loss avoids opening of bladder concomitant anti incontinence surgery is possible it if failed subsequent approach is not compromised disadvantage being vaginal shortening and stenosis is a uh, is a is a possibility risk of inadequate closure due to less space and urethric implant or augmentation cystoplasty is not possible now the trans abdominal approach can repair the advantages can repair other associated condition like urethral vaginal fistula complex fistula involving other organs augmentation cystoplasty can be done complicated fistula multiple attempt larger than large, large than uh, larger than 4 cm and combined transvaginal transabdominal approach can be done so the route of repair route again depends mostly on surgeon's training and experience so we generally repair by vaginal route as already explained we reserve abdominal approach for selected patient with simultaneous intraabdominal pathology failed uh, vaginal route and where there is a very large fistula now the next is whether to excise or not to excise so the classical teaching was excision of tract but now generally challenged and not widely followed so advantage of not excising the fistula tract so uh, it is a smaller if we don't excise a fistula tract it is a smallest smaller defect to repair less bleeding because the tract margins are fibrous so bleeding from freshly excised margin may require coagulation and further if near urethrovesical junction or urethric orifice reimplantation may be avoided and there is a strong fibrous ring of tract provides strength to suture line so again in vaginal route we don't excise the fistula tract in abdominal route because there is abundance of bladder tissue so we may excise we usually excise in ab- abdominal route but vaginal route we don't excise the fistula tract now the interposition uh, flap is again uh, up to the surgeon uh, comfort most uncomplicated simple fistula just require a good multi layer tension free repair interposition uh, flap when complicating factors are present like radiation fistula prior failed surgery or poor quality of tissue is present and in all cases of urethro vaginal fistula interposition graft is required but otherwise a simple vvf good prognosis vvf where there are good tissues present only a good multi layer tension free repair suffices and interposition flap is usually not required interposition flap we can use marsh's flap mainly in cases of urethral and trigonal fistula use of rotation flap of entire labia inner thigh skin and both or both to cover large vaginal wall defect we can use grishelis flap for unusual radiation fistulas and we can use peritoneal flap in higher fistulas 
so uh, what is the role of conservative approach very limited role small fistulas less than 1 cm which are diagnosed within 7 days of index surgery unrelated to carcinoma or radiation a trial of indwelling catheter and anticholinergic for 2 to 3 weeks can be given fistula tract remaining open for more than 3 weeks after adequate indwelling catheter unlikely to resolve without further intervention small fistula less than 3.5 mm can be treated with endoscopic electrocoagulation with or without fibrillin sealants medical management options are estrogen replacement therapy acidification of urine antibiotics sids bath barrier ointment zinc oxide of warfarin basically to remove to prevent dermatitis now sir non surgical intervention the list is electrocautery fulguration can be done fibrin glue can be used laser welding with nd arc laser personally we have used in few cases where there was a very small fistula but with limited success the success rates are not great with uh, even with properly selected patient in 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 our experience but uh, to complete the list we uh, should know the indication now the surgical repair there no single approach which is best for all the cases best opportunity to achieve a successful repair is with the initial surgery failed attempt increases scarring anatomical deception and compromise potential flaps so the uh, the basic principle of obstetric fistula repair are broad mobilization of the fistula so that it can be closed without tension at the site of repair water tight closure of the injury adequate bladder emptying in the post operative period so that suture line does not become over distended and break down application of this fistula to any individual case may be quite challenging particularly if the fistula is complicated fistula surgery should definitely be performed by experienced pelvic surgeon transabdominal procedures available are extraperitoneal transvesical procedures like o'connor landis kilburnet and transperitoneal procedures like mundis so this is a typical o'connor repair where uh, it is a transabdominal extraperitoneal repair we open the anterior bladder wall we till the uh, fistula tract we circumcise the fistula tract we excise the fistula tract we repair the vaginal wall in single layer and bladder wall in two layers and then we interpose omen available in omentum between the vaginal wall and the omen and the bladder wall other techniques we can use is uh, laparoscopic approach robotic assisted approach transurethral endoscopic suturing the technique is same the 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 way of doing the surgery may be different it may be open surgery laparoscopic robotic assisted approach transvaginal procedures in a narrow vaginal vault increase exposure we can increase the exposure if there is a limited space in the vagina by a posterolateral relaxing incision and the use of cystoscopy and urethral cath catheter placement is also very limited if the fistula is very large and it is very close to the ureteric orifice routinely we don't uh, catheterize the uh, the ureteric orifice only in special cases where the uh, fistula is very close to ureteric orifice a pre operative cystoscopy is done in all the cases optionally a supra pubic catheter may be help and we put supra pubic catheter by the help of lauslet tractor and uh, again it is done in cases where there is a very large uh, vvf otherwise routinely we don't put spc only a periurethral catheter post repair transvaginal procedures available are latsco which is pulpoclysis ras webster which is inverted cone shaped excision so two commonly pro, uh, performed procedure by vaginal surgeons are latsco procedure and ras procedure we should know about the detail of this procedure procedure as well as indication of these procedures so what is the position of the patient so two common positions uh, positions of the patient are lithotomy which is the most common position i think all of you must have seen um, uh, the second common position is a prone jackknife or livers lithotomy position so this is a basically a prone jackknife position it gives a very excellent uh, um, orient uh, excellent um, this thing visualization of the operative field especially your uh, trigon area and the urethral area so a urethrovaginal fistula can be repaired very nicely with this uh, position but the problem with this position is uh, again like in pcnl it makes anesthesia more hazardous and uh, the pl placement is a bit cumbersome otherwise it is a very good uh, position for exposure of urethra and bladder neck so uh, coming first to the latsco repair 
so where we use latsco technique latsco technique is basically you should know latsco is for post hysterectomy vasico vaginal fistula it is for post hysterectomy this is very important it is not for post cesarean vvf or any other vvf it is for post hysterectomy vvf okay why for only for post hysterectomy vvf because the lat post hysterectomy fistula are at the vault of vagina are at vaginal vault so they are very higher fistula but because there is no uterus so we can just put the catheter in the fistula and we can easily pull the fistula into the operative field so this can be possible if there is no uterus in case where there is a uterus the pulling of the fistula into the operating field is difficult vaginally so let's go technique is basically for post hysterectomy vvf that we should remember what we do is a simple we give a circumferential incision is made around the fistula fistula is not excised <clears throat> vaginal epithelium is mobilized approximately 2 cm from the fistula so this is these are the technique where we we are giving circumcised incision around the fistula we have uh, put a catheter uh, whatever size like 10 or 8 french catheter into the fistula and we pull the catheter so that the fistula comes in the operating field so this makes the life of the surgeon very easy and then we give a incision around the fistula tract we raise the vaginal flaps we dissect we so so now we repair uh, a good repair is done on the fistula we don't excise the fistula and then we repair the vaginal epithelium so this is uh, a typical uh, ras repair where we uh, we take a inverted u shaped incision again we give a circumscribed incision on the vaginal mucosa we raise the flap anteriorly as well as posteriorly a posteriorly u shaped incision is given We, this is uh, the diagram is showing the the uh, the the anterior and posterior flaps of vaginal epithelium they are being raised this is again a, a same diagram so what 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 is the basic principle why do we want to raise these flaps this is very important so basic theory of vvf is there is ischemia to the tissues so what happens there is a communication between bladder and vagina and the very important layer that is the pubo cervical fascia or a perivascular tissue they are retracted laterally so if this is the fistula if, if this is the fistula the perivascular tissue they are retracted laterally because of ischemia they are they are the one which are basically damaged so, and there is a communication between vaginal epithelium and bladder and uh, epithelium so what we need to do is we want to reapproximate this perivascular tissue or pubo cervical fascia what we call so for that we have to raise the flaps of vaginal epithelium at least 2 cm around the fistula site so this is very important uh, so the first step that is we raise the uh, flaps of vaginal epithelium is very important and they should be at least at least 2 cm away from the fistula site so this is again a diagrammatic representation of uh, we have uh, raised the anterior and posterior vaginal flaps after this we uh, take interrupted sutures first layer of uh, uh, of the fistula tract we close uh, by interrupted sutures so in the first layer we take the whole thickness of the bladder and the vaginal wall that is the fistulous part the fistulous fistulous tract a strong bite of tissue 2 to 3 mm from the margin of fistula is obtained so this is the first layer we are taking um, uh, interrupted sutures and we close the first layer after we close the first layer then we dissect the perivascular tissue now we have raised, we have we have closed the first layer now second is the perivascular tissue this is very important a healthy perivascular tissue second layer interrupted suture should be taken and they should be closed over the first layer the this uh, the second layer consists of perivascular fascia and deep musculature of the bladder so like lambert suture the first layer is bladder epithelium and uh, the fistula tract the second layer is perivascular tissue and deep musculature of the bladder so it is not through and through the bladder it is perivascular tissue with deep muscular layer so this is a second layer of interrupted tissue so uh, the, the this the most important part of the repair is the second layer for me it is the most important part of the repair and then then we approximate the third layer if there is requirement of an interposition flap or interposition uh, 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 flap then we make to the marshes or, or peritoneum or omentum 
and we close the vaginal epithelium. So a peritoneum, a peritoneum reflection can be taken. So again, if there is a uh, post hysterectomy fistula, omentum can be easily approached. If there is, it is not a post hysterectomy fistula, a high fistula, peritoneum can be used. If it is an anterior vaginal wall fistula, post cesarean. So what we do, we, we can take Marshall slab because the for fibro fatty layer, the Marshall slab usually does not go up to the vault, vaginal vault. It is basically for urethra or anterior, anterior vaginal vault. So tissue interposition, so uh, for a transvaginal approach, we have option of labial pad pad, which is very commonly used. Bulbospongiosis muscle flap can be used. Gracialis muscle flap can be used. Island flap can be used. Peritoneal or omental flap can, can be used. From transabdominal approach, omental flap, peritoneal flap, ileal seromuscular flap, gracialis flap or rectus abdominis muscle flap can be used. Marshall's pad fat, we all know how to uh, uh, take the Marshall's uh, fat. The more important, uh, rather than surgical technique, what uh, my message is that we should know where we can apply Marshall's fat. What sometimes happen, ki, uh, we have uh, repaired the first layer and then we have uh, take, given the incision and we have extracted Marshall and it is not going up to the fistula side. So it can cover only the urethral part or anterior vaginal wall, not the vault. For wall, the better flaps from vaginal root are omentum or periperitoneum. So this is the diagram of bulbospongiosis bulbo muscle flap. Then gracialis muscle flap we can use in post radiation VVS. Now very important part again is post operative care. So a good antibiotic cover is essential. Vaginal fat is typically removed 48 hours after surgery. Prolonged indwelling catheter minimum for 10 days. Routinely we keep for two to three weeks. Cystogram is uh, controversial. We don't routinely do cystogram after a uneventful repair, but if it is a complicated fistula and uh, then a cystogram should be done prior to catheter removal. After catheter removal, this is very important. Patient should be instructed to avoid over distension of bladder by timed and frequent voiding. She should avoid sexual intercourse for three months, avoid pregnancy for one year. This should be written in all discharges. And caesarean section is almost, if patient is, is become pregnant later, caesarean section is almost all, all absolutely indicated. So a normal delivery, patient should be all counseled that the normal delivery is usually not possible. So fistula surgeon, they have traditionally reported success as their ability to close the hole between the bladder and the vagina. But it is not only the fistula part. The patient should have post-operatively a normal bladder storage and an emptying function. They should remove, regain normal sexual functioning, um, normal menstrual cycle, normal reproductive capacity. So it should be considered as whole rather than just a whole. So just to complete the list, urethrovaginal fistula, it is uncommon. Most common cause is hydrogenic injury during surgery, lower segment, caesarean section, ruptured uterus repair and emergency obstetric hysterectomy. Presentation is usually a urinary incontinence with a very important catch of normal voiding between uh, normal voiding is usually present. So it is uh, incontinence with normal voiding. Diagnosis can be, again, we can uh, a diet test. We can uh, differentiate between the small VVS and urethrovaginal fistula. The usually CT urography, upper track imaging like CT urography, RGP, MR urography, they clinch the diagnosis. And uh, cystic urethroscopy can also be used and RGP can be used. So when we suspect urethrovaginal fistula, we exclude VVS by the help of cystoscopy. But confirm the diagnosis with the help of upper track imaging like IVP, RGP or CT urography. In case of acute presentation, like if their patient is immediately after surgery, we can attempt stent placement. So if it is successful, we uh, keep the stent for four to six weeks and then we repeat imaging. If there is resolution of fistula, it's okay. If there is no resolution of fistula, then, then we have to operate. And if the stent placement is not possible and there is urinary leakage, we can try, we can do PCN also at that time, at that point of time. So urethral stenting or PCN decompression immediately when there is acute presentation, uh, there is not much role of conservative management. Surgical repair options are urethroneocystostomy, transurethroneocystostomy, eyelid substitution or renal autotransplantation. Urethroneocystostomy is usually sufficient. Urethrovaginal fistula, 
is again uncommon but nowadays common because of more uh, use of this anti incontinence surgery urethral erosion of mesh into the urethra urethral diverticulum surgery anterior vaginal wall prolapse surgery so it is usually iatrogenic most commonly most common causes include tissue ischemia problem related to healing or radiation necrosis so urethra being a high pressure system during voiding a fibrofreti flap is strongly recommended so vvf there is the option if it is a simple fistula we can avoid a interposition flap but in urethra we always use a interposition flap being it a high pressure system so they are always complicated fistula so these are some of the diagrams where uh, it is being shown how to operate a, a urethro vaginal fistula so the steps are almost same the steps are almost same like a vvf only difference is that we always have to use a, a fibro fatty flap or interposition graft in case of uh, urethro vaginal uh, fistula and a second layer should be adequately dissected a periurethral fascia should be adequately dissected and second layer repair in both vvf and uvf is very important and that uh, will decide your success so this is the marshes flap being taken so complete the risk there are vasico uterine and vasico uh, cervical fistulas which are rare they are usually complication of cesarean section and can incontinence may or may not be present physical examination may be normal rarely you need trickle down through the os cyclic hematuria is very important clinical sign uh, which clinches the diagnosis and uh, abdominal approach is usually uh, done with interposition of graft for repair using the technique for vvf and hysterectomy is considered when the family is completed so uh, this complete the list of urinary fistulas um, dr chawla sir uh, yeah. we have case presentation also yeah so, just a minute let me case. see if somebody has responded to the chat section uh, anybody who, who would like to volunteer himself for discussing the case with dr hemant yeah i think you can go ahead with the uh, with your case discussion uh, there is no uh, resident uh, at present willing to discuss the case here. yeah i think gaurav gupta is there and we have karandeep uh, karandeep and gaurav can you unmute yourself and uh, keep your video on karandeep and gaurav please yeah yes sir please hemant you have gaurav and karandeep okay yes sir okay okay uh, and uh, hemant over to you the both will be discussing you have two cases or one case the two cases two cases. short cases sir two cases not yeah. very so short. what we'll do is we'll go ahead with the first case and then we will see for second case anybody else is there to discuss with you otherwise we'll continue with them okay okay, okay. okay. thank you uh, so we just for the, the the basic of these uh, case presentation is uh, you should basically know how you you have to face these cases in your, in your exam so uh, so the thought it just to invoke your thought process how how to answer in exam so this is a 45 year old female a resident of up with a chief complaint of continuous dribbling of urine per vaginum for last six uh, for last three months there is a history of uh, uh, trans abdominal it is basically for last six months there is a history of trans abdominal hysterectomy six months back for dysfunctional uterine bleeding Polis catheter removed on post-operative uh, POD seven, and he she developed continuous dribbling of urine after a week. She also has normal voiding pattern. So, uh, Arun, what can be the differential diagnosis? Uh, sir, in this patient, because of uh, the uh, patient having history of hysterectomy, sir, we have to consider a. Uh, uh sir vvf fistula or sir and as patient has normal voiding pattern in between we can consider a uh, urethro uh, sir vaginal fistula as well sir so the very important is he uh, you have to give your differential diagnosis like number 1 2 3 like this you don't there are multiple multiple possibilities but what do you think it, this is there is a history of trans abdominal hysterectomy police catheter remove on day 7 she developed dribbling of urine continuous dribbling of urine after seven, after a week of police catheter removal 
and also now she has normal wording pattern also so 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 gorav you will uh, what will be your uh, differential diagnosis uh, so first i would like to keep uh, ureter vaginal fistula as first diagnosis because uh, she is also having normal wording pattern okay uh, one is i think so and so in uh, second case uh, was i was was i covered on fistula okay do so you think uh, with vasico vagina so you have to be again specific the first is uvf very utero vaginal fistula that is uh, there no doubt about it second you should say a small vvf because a small vvf can yes, present yes, with incontinence mm-hmm. with a normal wedding pattern so you okay, have to sir. be very specific a large vvf cannot present like this so 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 it is very utero vaginal small vvf and third is a rare possibility of a stress urinary incontinence maybe patient is having stress urinary incontinence so there is leaking and there is also a normal wording pattern so it is a rare possibility but these three things you should keep in mind okay yes sir. so uh, the, this, this is a obstetric history general physical examination is normal uh, per abdominal there is a midline vertical scar of previous abdominal hysterectomy on palpation there is no tenderness no organ megaly or per vaginal examination the vaginal introitus is normal vagina is capacious defect palpable of size about 0.5 cm over anterior fornix near the vaginal vault per speculum examination rest the vaginal mucosa everything is normal so now which investigation would you like to do karan which investigation would you or, or garav you can tell which investigation would you like to do now uh so first i would like to do a cystoscopy uh to check the size of the fistula and uh, the site site uh, location of the fistula and uh, the, your, your first diagnosis is uh, ureter vaginal fistula so how will you check the size and site of fistula it is your first primary diagnosis is not vvf sir uh, in uh, in cystoscopy we can also check the any any clinical test test bedside or you are available in your opd which you can do or minor ot which you can do sir so swab test uh, we can do sir so so what is specific test? i have told in my presentation what is specific you can do your your diagnosis is between a urethro vaginal and a small vvf so how yes, will you differentiate clinically uh, with a with a, some bedside test uh sir uh, by using methylene blue uh, uh, swab test uh, we can di- we can differentiate these two fistulas sir when such patient come you can just you you know there is a opening in vagina but you don't know whether there is an opening in bladder or the or the opening is in ureter so what you can do is you can do a methylene blue test and you can uh, identify whether it is a uvf or vvf the the because cystoscopy you should do later because now if there is a v, uvf ureter vaginal fistula you can directly go ahead with a ct urography or ivp to identify and then you can go ahead with cystoscopy cystoscopy scopy should be done but if i am suspecting vvf i'll directly go ahead with cystoscopy and later i will do a ct uro to exclude a concomitant uh, ureteric injury okay but if i am suspecting yes, uterovaginal fistula i will do uh, first upper tract imaging and then i will do cystoscopy that is only a change between these two okay yes sir yes sir so so investigation others all are all are normal um how will you uh, urine culture was showing e coli of uh, Uh, more than 10 to power 5 per ml so uh, what is the significance in specifically in case of vvf is there any significance of this urine culture urine culture will anyway be uh, positive because of the uh, contamination by vaginal flora sir in these patients so so, so it's uh, again this, this is very important point because the patient especially in vvf they are not able to collect urine because there is no normal voiding yes, so the specimen is almost always contaminated Yes, so it will just decide your perioperative antibiotic but it is not infection it is basically contamination okay because the, the patient is not able to collect urine like normal normal because there is no normal voiding pattern okay in especially in vvf so so urine culture is just to decide your perioperative antibiotics so ct urography is showing a right moderate hydroeutonephrosis left kidney and ureter is normal and there is a fistulous communication between right right ureter ureter and bladder and, and bladder is normal okay so ct urography we have uh, done and uh, then cystoscopy 
is uh, bilateral uretic orifice are seen, but there is no reflex, uh, no efflux from the right uretic orifice. Rest of the bladder is normal. And there is a fistula on vaginoscopy. There is a fistula opening, 0.5 into 0.5 centimeter. Any other investigation you would like to have? So, uh, RGP. So, uh, I basically, do you know? Do you think there is any need of RGP? So this, this is just to trap you. <laughs> Because there is no need of, because now you are sure that it is a right um, uh, urethrovaginal fistula, bladder is normal. Okay, but just I am asking, you are saying RGP. Basically, the indication of RGP is in case of acute presentation. Suppose um, a, a gynae resident calls you and uh, six days or five days after injury, after, after a surgery, there is an abdominal collection. You are suspecting a urinary ascites. Okay, at that the point of time, and there is, they, they have already done a CT urography, there is some partial extravasation of contrast into the bladder. That point of time, you may try RGP and stenting. So RGP should be followed by stenting. Now it is six months after the surgery, there is no role of stenting. This fistula, this, okay. this fistula need to be excised and we need to do a surgical intervention. So there is no role of RGP now. Okay. So, 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 uh, so, uh, uh, what type of repair will you do? Uh, Transabdominal repair with interposition, uh, omental or peritoneal slaps. It is not VVF. It is urethrovaginal fistula. Uh, so, a urethrovaginal. So you do a transabdominal repair. Ure ureter cannot be repaired from the vaginal route. So, there is only yes, one. Sir. You can do open. Laparoscopy, robotic, whatever you want to do. There is a simple ureteric implantation, what you need to do. Ureteric implant. You have to do a ureteroneocystostomy. 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 So the important is whether you would go for a reflexing or non-reflexing anastomosis. Sir, uh, non-reflexing. So, so, so generally, if the family is complete, you do a reflexing anastomosis. If there is a, uh, if it is a right side anastomosis, the family is not complete. If she, she, she can have further pregnancies, you can go ahead with non-reflexing anastomosis. Okay. So, so, so this is something which you should know ki what is the battery of investigation, like sequence-wise, what you should do. So, so uh, it is different in VVF and QBF. So uh, this is a second case where there is a 40 year female resident of Delhi. Uh, we, uh, sir, we go ahead with same, same, same resident. Please go ahead. So this is a 40 year female resident of Delhi and her chief complaint is continuous dribbling of urine per vaginum since three months. There is a history of transabdominal hysterectomy three months back for fibroid uterus. Foley's was removed on post of day five and since then there is, uh, she developed continuous dribbling of urine after catheter removal. So uh, now what are the differential diagnoses, Gaurav? Uh, so first, uh, I would like to keep uh, the psychovaginal fistula. Uh, so second, uh, any other fistula like uh... like Hello. Uh, what are the second? Uh, there is there is one differential is your uh, BVF. Second, any other? Continuous three things you should remember. Okay, there is VVS, there is can be SU, they can be stress unary incontinent. This can be simple stress unary incontinence. Okay, yeah, there can be grade three SUI yes, with, with continuous leakage of urine. Okay, it is rare, but there is a it is a differential diagnosis. Okay, they can be concomitant yes. UTF with VVS. Okay. So so yes, so differential you should you should keep in mind those only then you can properly examine the patient and you can uh, select right investigation for her. So, uh, so one more point is like in this, there is one more important point is that the patient developed uh, incontinence immediately after removal of catheter. Okay, and in that case, in in, in first case, she she developed incontinence seven days after removal of catheter. So so the so the physiology the, the basically pathogenesis of fistula is different in VVF and UVF. UVF may, it is usually ureteric injury where there is co collection of urine in the abdomen 
and then it comes out through the through the path of least resistance that is vagina so it is created first the collection is in the abdomen in u in in uv in uvf here vvf there is a direct communication between the bladder and the vagina there is no intra abdominal collection in the in the bladder injury usually you don't find a intra abdominal collection or urinary ascites okay they directly drain into through the vagina so the fistula formation is a bit early okay so that is also very important is that immediately after removal of catheter if there is a fistula there is some element of bladder injury okay, okay. yes sir so so again obstetric history was p1 l1 lscs ats back per abdomen uh, most of the things were normal midline vertical scar of previous abdominal hysterectomy was there 14 french periurethral catheter was in c2 on palpation no tenderness no organomegaly so uh, how will you examine the patient what are the specific things you will see in, your, in the examination of the patient uh, sir in local examination we will look for uh, sir positive cough uh, uh, sir leakage of urine on cough sir we will look for uh, cystophile uh, on local examination sir these all things you will look if you don't find a fistula yes sir so so what the first thing like on physical the, the patient with a continuous dribbling of urine continuous incontinence of urine post surgery your first diagnosis differential diagnosis is vvf vvf okay. sir vvf rare, rare causes are grade 3 sui concomitant uvf vvf so 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 for vvf what you do first uh, sir we will do a provisional examination to feel for any defect and So you have uh, to answer. We can do. You have to identify the defect. A first speculum examination to... can be done, sir. Speculum examination very important. You have to see the location of the defect, whether the defect is present or not. Second thing. Uh, so then we have to look for the uh, so the uh, so the capacity of the vagina, the mucosa, and uh, sir, adjoining uh, mucosa, whether it is healthy or unhealthy, sir, and uh, whether. Uh, Uh, so then the site and size of the fistula uh, of the uh, fistula sir whether the fistula is present or not the site of the yes, fistula sir. the size of the fistula the location you have told okay the fistula the the fistula tract you have to examine you have to see the adjacent vaginal mucosa whether it is healthy or not so whether the fistula is mature or immature and adjacent vaginal mucosa is healthy or not the next very important point is uh, whether the vagina is capacious or not Because that will determine whether you can do a vaginal repair, a good vaginal repair or not. So when you are examining the patient, you are seeing the, the whether the fish whether fistula is present or not, whether it is ready for operation or not, and third thing is the route of operation. These these three things are decided on your examination. So this is very important. Okay, the examination part is very important, and you have to see for concomitant extra fistula also. Sometimes there are. one large fistula and one small fistula we often miss the smaller fistula and that may be a cause of recurrence okay so uh, in this case there was a palpable defect of about 1 cm over anterior vaginal wall um, sorry vaginal wall and uh, the margin was smooth the anterior the vaginal mucosa was healthy and um, rest rest was normal there was no no sui So what investigation we will do now? For OP for this patient. Okay. Sir, you would uh, like Michelin blue test or something? Cystoscopy, sir. So I have test or something you would like to do or directly cystoscopy? Sir, uh, directly cystoscopy, sir. Because we see we know that this is psycho vaginal fistula, so uh, there is no not much doubt with the history or anything. So we can directly go ahead with cystoscopy. So yes. I think uh, this was the seat. in in this case the cystoscopy revealed a one centimeter trigonal like it was just adjacent to right urethral orifice. One centimeter fistula was there. It was communicating with the vagina. Uh, rest any other investigation you like to do now? we would like to examine the upper uh, upper urinary tract sir by uh, oh. either a ct urography or a ivp sir because so there is a chance of uh, concomitant and on cystoscopy you are able to see efflux from bilateral ureter okay so a simple ultrasound will also suffice yes sir okay sir 
okay there they has to be some an element of hydroeutonephrosis so if there is a good efflux from both the ureteron cystoscopy and uh, the simple ultrasound can also suffice if there is no upper tract changes there is that excludes your uh, urethrovaginal fistula okay yes, so 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 uh, how will you repair this fistula so this is a fistula uh, basically it is a just in the trigone so can you tell me what are the steps so uh, we can repair it uh, transvaginally uh, through uh, let's go repair sir so what are the advantage of let's go repair or what are the disadvantage of let's go repair uh, sir uh, this present at, at more vaginal. comfortable so this is present at vaginal wall 1 cm and uh, so what are the advantage and disadvantage post hysterectomy fistula Uh, so it's a simple type of fistula, uh, and uh, uh, through transvaginal repair, its uh, post-operative period is uh, uh, easier for the patient with less complication and uh, uh, so less infection rate in comparison to abdominal route. Uh, so this is post-hysterectomy, so. it will be easier to bring out the fistula into the operative field as well sir right sir. Uh, so this is this is important ki uh, post hysterectomy fistula what advantage are it is a simple technique okay just we have to remove the we have to make create a circumcised incision we can retract the fistula into the, into the operating field and we have to take just the thick bites of the fistula and we have to close this fistula and then then it is a simple technique but uh, what are the disadvantage So this can lead to vaginal shortening. Vaginal okay. shortening and dyspareunia in future. Yeah. So so that 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 so it is it has to be done in capacious vagina and patient should be counselled about this. Okay. So what yes. any other yes, uh, technique which you know of a repair vaginally? Ah, uh, last technique. Last technique, sir. That is. What are the indication for that? So usually after in hysterectomy patients, sir, uh, RAS technique is done, sir, uh, and uh, okay. So it's not not hysterectomy, any any, and it is for anterior vaginal wall fistula, like uh, not wall fistula, anterior vaginal wall fistula. Basically, you have to uh, you can have RAS technique. In this uh, inverted U-shaped incision is take, taken, and a layer by layer uh, repair is done. okay so uh, and uh, what is the post op protocol the post op protocol is sir we have to keep a indwelling catheter for at least uh, 10 days and there should be antibiotic appropriate antibiotic coverage sir for the patient also the patient has to be advised against sexual activity for at least 3 months and uh, the patient is advised to avoid pregnancy for 1 year and if there is any pregnancy in the future it is it is better that the patient gets it operated by a cesarean section sir so the patient there was a very large fistula over approximately 5 cm somewhere um, uh, abdominal uh, repair was done now the patient is coming with um, a small uh, vvf so how will you approach the patient Sir, if abdominal repair has already been tried, it is uh, and it is a small VVF. Sir, we can apply. Uh, we can approach the patient via vaginal approach. Sir. Okay. And uh, if uh, if you are not able to access the vagina properly because it is not a very capacious vagina, so how can you proceed? Then, uh, so then, so then abdominal. You can, uh, you can take give a postulateral relaxing incision. and you can make it capacious yes sir okay okay sir endoscopically also sir it can be tried endoscopically also endoscopically like so endoscopic endoscopic management or conservative management is usually for um, very small fistula less than 3.5 mm and which are recognized early once usually delayed fistula they don't very good outcome with the uh, minimal invasive approach so you need to repair the best is you should repair and the first time repair is the ideal repair the best the best repair should be the first repair 
subsequent repairs are with high uh, failure rate so um, i think sir these are the common thing which we should know in uh, urethro vaginal or psycho vaginal fistula uh, any specific question you would uh, like to know any doubts any role of sir pridium sir that we give for identification of urethric orifice iridium so uh, that is uh, what practically we use is when there is a acute urethric like the typical scenario of a uh, gynecological resident they are calling at seven post operative day the patient is having urinary ascites and we are not able like the plan is to do a cystoscopy rgp plus minus gg stenting so yes. that time where there is acute urethric injury there is there is a role of iridium you should always give iridium to the patient because to identify the proximal ureter sometimes we have to do ureteroscopy also like in uh, rgp there is a small streak of uh, contrast which which is extravasating and small streak of contrast which is going in the proximal ureter so we have to do ureteroscope and we can identify the proximal ureter by iridium is coming from there so we have done one or two cases like this and uh, this help because we, we place guide wire in proper place and a stent over it occasionally it may heal the it avoid the structure to form and uh, okay. second is uh, there is a conventional there was uh, this uh, triple uh, swab test in which we can give pyridium and methylene blue a combination of that but uh, it's usually not done nowadays with a with a standard modified methylene blue test only with um, it can differentiate a urethrovesical fistula with a small bbf a typical three swab test is no more of any matlab major value nowadays any other any other queries anybody who would like to ask any question or they can unmute themselves and ask a question i think that there are some question so that that double uh, dye test or triple swab test i have answered because yeah. uh, that is usually not required nowadays but i think yeah. sir uh, chavla sir aap in your practice also i think matlab we have we have never required no, these, these these are uh, become like something like a examiner's delight they are fond of asking the questions that's why they should know um, uh, the the double dye triple swab uh, the four swab test and all that are usually not needed Uh, only thing is if uh, you are doing well then examiner may ask and some of the examiners uh, who are very experienced and little old they are fond of asking this question yeah uh, but what what you have to understand uh, i i don't know if you have focused the your attention to the presentation i think every slide was packed with a lot of information um right from uh, the beginning the classification of the urinary fistulas the evaluation of a patient present with the leak uh, uh, the coverage of uh, uh, the uh, uh, dye test as well as the swab test the complete evaluation uh, the ct scan and if you see the uh, management uh, differentiating between early and uh, the late then choosing the vaginal versus the abdominal or choosing the combination of vaginal versus abdominal and the slide which showed the the type of interposition tissue which we can use that was excellent but what you have to understand is when he was discussing the case he has mentioned um, the history and then he was coming to the examination part if you had focused carefully he was he was giving the information the same way you have to present in the exam like inspection you have a pv you have a perspectum then you go for the cystoscopy vaginoscopy and all the finding the same way which he has put in the slide same way it has to come so that was actually um, uh, the part where you would have paid lot of attention this is the same with same flow everything has to come um he has to, i think the uh, one important thing if you see during his presentation was he was always keeping the uh, stress urine incontinence diagnosis in contention uh, this is also uh, the examiner's uh, favorite question what else what else when they are asking you uh, you have to keep in mind that the examiner wants to go one step further and want to 
uh, know what other one or two diagnoses. And this is usually is is uh, is rare, but not very uncommon, especially uh, for the people who have just got the hysterectomy done and are not for SQS. I think there's a background noise here. If you want, I'll sit in opening. If you want, I'll go to the opening. Yeah. So, um, 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 the slides were uh, packed with a lot of information. Um, I wish uh, the candidate would have um, uh, this our focus uh, the um, their attention to the material which was there on the slide. But uh, over uh, overview of all the fistulas uh, have been a, a excellent presentation. Uh, the the uh, presentation of the operative photographs, especially showing the let's go and the RAS repair. And I think uh, these were uh, almost, uh, you can just uh, keep this in your mind and you can just, uh, uh, on the day of examination, you are the same steps which were shown in the photographs, so you can easily uh, reciprocate. Uh, um, uh, excellent presentation, Hemant. Congratulations to you. Uh, sir, uh, over to you, Dr. Rajiv Susan. Thank you, Dr. Arun Chawla. Thank you, Dr. Hemant. I think this was excellent presentation from the point of view of residents. And we should always uh, remember that uh, fistulas can be sometimes multiple. Sometimes a small fistula can be missed. There can be complex fistulas. There can be uh, radiation, uh, post-radiation, or maybe large fistulas, or maybe Yusuf syndrome. That is along with the psychovaginal fistula or there can be cyclic hematuria. And these are certain questions which come from the examiner that is suddenly you will ask what is the use of syndrome. Suddenly you will ask that uh, what is the complex fistula. And um, multiple fistulas can be there, cystoscopy when you are doing. There can be a small uh, another fistula also you can find. It is not necessary that only one fistula which you have seen is the final fistula. And similarly, uh, all the aspects have been covered. Sometime when uretrovesical uh, uh, fistula is repaired, it is a question uh, which has been uh, discussed uh, several times, and that is that uh, what is source heat? How you will uh, remove the tension from the uh, fistula side? So these are the things which, which need to be uh, stressed. And as Dr. Hemant has mentioned, that earlier it, it was uh, thought that the abdominal root is a urologist root and the general root is the, the gynecologist root. That is no more uh, uh, relevant. And uh, your answer, if you are comfortable, whatever root, that is the best root, but the, most of the fistulas can be tackled from uh, the general root only. And even high fistulas, which, which were uh, tackled uh, in the past by Dr. Uh, Shromar Raj, uh, they, they, in the book uh, text, it is written that they have used that. And uh, that, that route is also used for even high fistulas also. And uh, nowadays, iatrogenic fistulas, which are uh, very commonly coming, and you will find the patients in that ward and in the examination invariably. It is not necessary that you will wait, they will wait for obstructive fistula, but you can kind of find any kind of fistula which is going to be the question can be asked. So, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Yeah. Uh, Hemant Goel. Thank you for the residents for participating. Tomorrow is also a similar topic that is the stress urinary uh, um, uh, incontinence, and Dr. Arvind Pandey is going to. Deliberate on that. In continuation, these two lectures are going to be very, very useful. And uh, now we are in the series of these uh, distant learning lectures uh, in the final stages. And I hope that these archives, and I will advise all the residents that these are available now on USI website. And uh, you should go and revisit these lectures. And they are going to be really helpful this is a part of the uniform curriculum and uniform education, distant learning. This is going a big way. Dr. Arun Chabla, I'm thankful to you also. You have highlighted the salient points very effectively from the resident perspective that uh, to uh, tell residents that how these uh, 
questions and these points are to be finer points are to be tackled so once again i'll thank each and everybody along with our technical team led by dr uh, mr navneet and uh, thank you very much and uh, dr arun can we close this session or yes, back sir, to yes, you sir. yeah with again thanks to hemant for an excellent uh, um, uh, lecture uh, we can close sir. yes sir thank you sir thank you thank you bye okay bye. thank you uh, good bye. night for the time being and tomorrow again we meet at 8 with dr arvind panda and that is a, going to be a great lecture on the stress urinary incontinence let us meet tomorrow again thank you good night thank you sir